Hi there and welcome to Footyology, the show that gives you more genuine grand final week fodder and less Brownlow wags on rotisseries. Okay, so we're not as good looking, but at least you won't bother asking who we're dressed by. I'm Rowan Connolly, with me is my co-host Mark Fine, and we're going to run the rule over two massive preliminary finals, the winners, the losers, and look ahead to the big one. We've got all the usual segments, hot or not, tomorrow's news today, a ripping edition of Rounds of Our Lives, keyboard Q&A, the rant off, who needs a red carpet and harebrained chit chat. So let's rip into it, as I say, very good afternoon to you, Finey. The doggies in the grand final, who said romance in football was dead? Woof, 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 <laughs> woof. Oh, it's magnificent. I, I know a lot of Swan supporters are a little bit peeved because the focus has been on the Bulldogs. It's nothing to do with the Swans, it's the fact that it's their first grand final since 61, and that means most of their supporters have never enjoyed this week, and that's what they need to do, just enjoy the week and immerse themselves in everything leading up to the grand final. It's going to be great fun. Well, it's a backhanded compliment to the Swans, really, isn't it? I mean, it was only 11 years ago they were the great romantic story, but they've been so successful. You know, this is their, what, fourth grand final in... No, fifth grand final in 12 that's right. seasons. So, uh, in a way, it's it's sort of saying, you know, we're, we're a bit sick of you. You're too good. And for the Swans, I, th- I think, um, look, it's been... I try and mark the era of since 2000, the new millennium. And, of course, Brisbane started off with the triple premiership. Hawthorne's had three in a row. But given that the Swans have been in 16 of the last 18 final series and shooting for their third flag, they can almost claim bragging rights to be the team of them, you know, to have overtaken Hawthorne. So there's plenty to play for on both sides of the coin. Well, I think if you go back to 1996 when they made their first grand final for, what, 41 years, yep. I think since then it's 17 out of 21 final series. No one, I think the next best is a bit, it might be Hawthorne or Geelong on about 17. So. Uh, it's phenomenal. They're, they are a phenomenal club. And look, I, you know, I, I'll put my hand on my heart here and say I, I do hope the Doggies win, but I'm very happy for the Swans to win it too. They're hardly uh, the Darth Vader of the AFL, are they? No, certainly for me. Who is the Darth Vader of the AFL? Oh, Collingwood. Still? Of course. I'm starting to feel sorry for them. <laughs> you'll, have your, you'll have your Essendon um, membership revoked or, or the... Oh, no, that already happened the day I put a Collingwood jumper on. But um, just, you know, for us, sort of growing up in the 70s and 80s, a Swans, Dogs, South Melbourne Footscray grand final, that, that's just redonkulous. Well, it's yeah, it's a far cry from uh, two men and a dog at the Lake Oval in round 17, isn't it? Yeah, you know, but it's more power to them and for both of those clubs, well done, because their roots have been different, but they've been admirable, the pair of them. I uh, couldn't agree more. Well, the two teams that had the rest get about six more months of it now. A flying start by one grand finalist, a rip-roaring finish from this Saturday's opponent, two preliminary finals to remember. Let's recall the very best and the very ordinary in Hot or Not. Footyology's Hot or Not is proudly brought to you by Trade Institute of Victoria. Start your future today at tiv.vic.edu.au. Right, I'm going to go first today. There are so many great stories in this grand final, but one of my favourite is little Benny McGlynn. We spoke to him on SEN after the game on Friday night. Played a fantastic, really got the ball rolling for him. You see this goal here, he kicks in about the first 30 seconds, I think. But what it's been probably the unluckiest story of any player involved. Played all year for Hawthorne in 07, injured 08, misses out in the flag. Goes to Sydney... Um, uh, misses out on 2012 flag after playing all season, got injured in the qualifying final, comes back, plays in 2014, they get thrashed by his old club with whom he misses out playing in three premierships. So third time lucky for him, hopefully, and I can't think of a player who uh, deserves success more than him. And he was no certainty about eight weeks ago to be in the team, but along with Papley, they formed a really good small forward uh, crumbing division and uh, a real danger for the doggies on the weekend. You're up. Here's a, a, a case of, uh, well, was it Edith Piaf that sang Je ne regret rien? Oh, I don't know. It was. <laughs> well, don't ask the question if you know the answer. No, it was. Yeah, I shouldn't have. It's rhetoric. But uh, there'll be some regrets from the Swans when Josh Dunkley takes the field on Saturday afternoon because he can play. He is, I am staggered in the heat of the kitchen. I mean, his ability, you'll see the footage here. It was hot on Saturday night mm. and he stood up to it. Now, the Sydney Swans almost stood aside because he said he wanted to play in Melbourne. They said, if a Melbourne club puts a bid in for you, we'll bow down. 
but if it's an interstate club, we'll pursue you. Uh, there's from a, For a ruthless team like the Swans that picked up uh, Buddy Franklin under the noses of GWS, that uh, seems to be a mistake. He is a really good footballer. He's got a, he's got a good football head. And, look, he's not the greatest kick in the world, but it's safe to say but he's still a better kick than his old man. Yeah, his old man started at St Kilda as a full forward in the reserves. And I, I used to go and watch the reserves play. His kicking as a full forward was... It wasn't comical. It was unbelievable how poor he was. That they never thought of moving him back because he had a sticky pair of hands as a kid. Went to Tassie for a year. Thought his dream of playing league footy was over and became a, a star with the Swans with a very famous grand final story himself. Yeah, well, I was going to say 20 years since uh, the Swans went to uh, the Supreme Court, I think, and got an injunction against the suspension that allowed him to play in that grand final. And, and he, I've interviewed him, you know, that really, it ruined the day for him. Mm. He has no happy memories of that grand final. It's not something he wanted. But remember, he was sort of dropped in by a commentator. Uh, it was... Well, he hit uh, James Hurd. And it was whipped up. Well, it's probably a bit of a giveaway when James Hurd got up to receive his Brownlow medal with a few stitches <laughs> under yeah. his eye. But, but, uh, but he didn't want that, Andrew Dunkley. He does want his son to win for the Doggies, though. The former Swan, I'm telling you, will be fairly and squarely in the corner of the Doggies on the weekend. All right, my turn and uh, a not for me. And uh, sad to say, it's the Cats. They've had a pretty good season, I reckon. But uh, it all turned to you-know-what on Friday night. They were gone at quarter time and... Again, I won't labour it, but I can't help thinking the long layoff. One game in 27 days was a factor. But they, really? They, well, no, we won't get into that. We'll, we'll do that later. But uh, they were just jumped by a better side. And it didn't give a yelp. That was the thing. I mean, they never really looked like making a game of it. And the midfielders beneath uh, Dangerfield and Selwood just didn't fire a shot. So I think when they're doing their review, that'll probably be the first thing they look at. So, you know, if we don't get our second-tier midfielders to step up, we've got to go out and get some more. I think they've got the best named player in the AFL. Wiley Buzzer? No, Josh Caddy. He's out there, <laughs> he's out there, but he's not playing. No, I didn't fire a shot. Mitch well, Duncan, I feel sorry. Uh, you see, Duncan, disappointing. I feel sorry for Caddy. You know, he had a great game last year against the Bulldogs. No Dangerfield, obviously, last year, and Selwood didn't play. His main opponent, Caddy, well, his opponents are Dangerfield and Selwood. He's, he's an inside mid. Mm. And that job's taken. They should trade Josh Caddy. He'd be more than handy for a club looking for some grunt inside because he can't get near the ball and nobody's handballing to him because he's not fast. He's not a line breaker. I think their midfield's imbalanced. I I don't think they read well as a team. They're leg heavy down the back end and they've got no zip at the front end. They've got some work to do. Okay, you're up. Uh, This is not became hot in the game on Saturday night. Caleb Daniel... Had a, he, he was really, he looked nervous. Yeah, he was ordinary. He right? was fumbly and double handling. And then this happened right near the end of the third quarter. To this point, Caleb Daniel was a liability. Dalhouse tackled by Patful. Desperate work there in the forward line. And picked up by Daniel for a vital snap just near three quarter time. And his last quarter was beautiful. Hit a couple of targets, got back in the game. The one caveat with Caleb, and watch for it on the weekend... Uh, he, he's just too small to lay effective tackles. They do bust through him a bit. So we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, no, he certainly lifted. He had a few mates too. Okay, my last is a, a very hot Clay Smith and probably won the game for him, really. The man uh, who, ke- who put the score on the board got him off to a good start. He was tough, um, good goal sense. And they've looked a much better side ever since he came back into it. His first game back after that knee reconstruction was in that great win over Sydney at the SCG. And he's just given them a bit more bite up forward and a a really indispensable part of it. And then, of course, to deliver that after uh, dealing with um, the tragedy of losing his friend in that car accident, died earlier in the week. And we saw how emotional he was afterwards. But fantastic effort not only to play, but to play as well as he did. And he's a a big uh, asset for him going into the grand final. You know, when he started, he was highly promising, hard as nails. But I'll tell you what, he was a terrible kick. And he's come back, obviously done what he could in his rehabilitation but he's pretty deadly now around goals which is anything but what he was when he started what a good player last one rhyming slang for underpants the old regs grundy i mean heath grundy is a ripper he's underrated alex rance is sort of universally considered the best fullback in the comp 
I think this guy puts in a pretty good argument himself. Never beaten. It was always going to be hard for Hawkins and therefore for Geelong. Uh, if Tom Boyd does play forward with the return or the availability of Roughhead, then don't expect any goals from that fella because this guy is as good as there is going around. Grundy's a champ. No, he's, he's a beauty and a, another remade forward and uh, shift to the other end's done wonders for him. All right, time for a short break. When we return, he's a bit dusty after all that brown low socialising, but our news hound was still ferreting away last night trying to pick up some of the good stuff. And no, we mean news. But first, Grant Dickinson doesn't take it any easier on coaches just because they're in finals. He demands answers once they can work out what his questions are all about on the pressing questions. Do you hear Damien Harbour thinks Richmond can make the finals next year? <laughs> We specialise in building and construction. We're getting students that are coming from interstate. I mean, that, that's real acknowledgement for us. TIV, Trade Institute of Victoria, we're proud of our students. The players are aware they need to watch Footyology 7.30 on Tuesday nights. It's really clear. Yep. Absolutely clear? Absolutely clear, yeah. Welcome back to Footyology. The biggest week of the season means all the focus is on two clubs, but John Pirrick knows that's precisely the time you're likely to catch the others off guard. And if there's beans to be spilled, this guy will be scooping them up. Doesn't even need cutlery. When he bursts forth with tomorrow's news today. How was your brown load, JP? You're looking a, a bit dusty to me. <laughs> It's a solid night, wasn't it? I it don't was know how you guys night. got through it for five hours non-stop talking. Well, we went straight home, but I, I noticed you were out in the hustings there. I thought uh, I heard some whispers about you dancing on the bar and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> That's tradition, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Not for you. <laughs> all right, what's going on? I was actually going to start with the grand finalists. Um, Tom Mitchell's obviously a name that's um, been spoken about regularly throughout the season where he's going to end up next year. Well, the Swans have offered him a five-year deal to stay. The issue being, though, the Swans feel that the Hawks are going to be able to offer him more money. So industry estimates that he's worth about between 500 and 550 a year. So he's, had, he's probably arguably been the Swans' best player through the finals this year, I think averaging about 28 touches. He was fabulous on Friday night, and it'd be a huge loss, wouldn't he, for the Swans if he was to leave. How much more do we think Hawthorne is offering, do we know? I uh, can't get to the bottom of that just at the moment, but it sounds as if it's like between sort of 50 and 100 a season. So hang on, that's 6 to 650 for Mitchell, 800 for O'Meara. <laughs> There's a, they're after a few, aren't they? Boy. Vickery as well. Gee, the salary cap's working well. They must have been, I'm assuming they've won the last three wooden spoons. Oh, I heard Sam Mitchell's actually paying Hawthorne to play. <laughs> Well, their senior players have taken a pay cut. But they'll get rid of a couple of players. The, the, the deal with O'Meara will involve a player leaving as well. So you can free up money pretty quickly. I reckon Mitchell would be mad to go, particularly if it's a five-year deal on the table. I mean, they, they are guaranteed to be up or near the top for quite a while yet, I think, given the way they've regenerated. And I, I, don't, I, think, Hawthorne, I don't think Hawthorne are going to slide, but it's going to be arguably a harder slog for them for a couple mm. of years than the Swans. And he could be the best midfielder there in two or three years. Yeah. He's not even going to be the best Mitchell at Hawthorne. <laughs> well, maybe not next season, but certainly after that. Yeah, he will. No, he's so. a good player. Yeah. Joel Hamling's out of contract at Geelong. He's a fabulous story, isn't he? Mm. Three years, I think, on Geelong's list and didn't play a senior game, was a delisted free agent. He's been at the Dogs for the last two years. There's a bit of talk Freo into him and he might may consider going home, but he said he wants to stay a Bulldog and you'd hope he does. Now's the time to get a contract. Yeah. Haven't, they got, haven't they got some great sort of low-profile defenders? Well, Marcus Fletcher. Adams is not in the team. Well, yeah. uh, he's been great, yep. you know, until he was injured. F uh, Fletcher Roberts, you know, I thought he was really good in the preliminary yeah. finals. Still might get dropped, you know. So Biggs. Big, Shane Biggs, yeah. yeah. Look, it's... Uh, um, they're two fairly low-profile defences this mm. week, but um, yeah, guys in both of them have, have been great all season. I mean, you consider they've got a half-back flank to choose from of Suckling, who didn't play this mm. week. Obviously, Jay Hannison, Robert Murphy comes back next year. They've got Biggs who can play across yeah. halfback flank. And they've got a kid in the VFL, played a couple of games this year, Rourke Smith. He's a ripper. Yeah. Yeah, and no, it was a convincing win by their VFL side, so they're not, yeah. uh, not short of depth. Yes. What else you got? Uh, speaking of defenders, we spoke to Corey Enright last night heading oh, yeah. into the Brownlow, and he's yeah. still weighing up whether he wants to play on next year. 
we all saw him in tears after the game on Friday night and sort of automatically thought that that was going to be it. But he said those tears were more through mixed emotions. It wasn't necessarily his final game, but obviously there was the Bartel factor. Perhaps that was his final game. The season ending in, in such a terrible note. Um, a bitter end, as Patrick Dangerfield's put it. So there was a bit on his mind at the time, but I, I still think he, he wants to play on, and he's probably done enough, hasn't he? Like, if you're an All-Australian, what, what oh, else can you do? He had a fantastic season. Absolutely no question if but he, he wants to play. But he was fumbly, though, on Friday hey? night, wasn't he? He yeah. fumbled a bit on Friday night. Yeah. And back. There was a Look, few uh, it was unusual to see him that emotional. Yeah. I mean, the big question is, Brownlow night, was he tired and emotional? I only spoke to him early on in the night, so I don't know how he was after midnight. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. I thought it might have been your shout for us. You know, they're in an interesting position, Geelong, because they're discussing, and right, they're discussing Bartell, and it's in Bartell's court. Hmm. But the one guy that actually has a, a rock-solid contract for next year, he's he's struggling, oh, Andrew no, Mackey. Say, yeah, no, well, I, I threw him up in a piece in the age today, actually, and um, yeah, I, I think of the veterans, he's probably the one who's struggled most. Mr Mackey, okay. <laughs> Very good. South Park reference there for those <laughs> who don't watch. And the Twilight Grand Final was in the oh, rounds of the Brownlow Medal. Go. Just Where's talk again, from? considering the ratings from last weekend's game between the Giants and Bring Dogs, it the 5.15 start. Yeah. Second most watched preliminary final ever. Yeah, I think uh, it's a good idea. You think it's time for it? Like, under oh, the new television deal that kicks in next year, I reckon the Seven would certainly want this. Oh, I think it's good because St Kilda can't win during the day. Do you... Re- no, I, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. Really? Yeah, look, it's such a... To, if your team's in the grand final or even grand final day, time sort of vanishes anyhow. You know, mm. two o'clock could be four o'clock, could be five o'clock. It really doesn't. So why not have it at two o'clock? Like what? What? I, I don't you get it. You still can have the afternoon barbecue and. Get, but get why? Your why is everyone so willing to sort of bend down to Channel 7's whims? Well, so they I mean, get more ratings. Yeah, but we don't care day. if Channel Seven get more ratings. Why would you guys say let's have a five fifteen grand final? Well, I guess the more ratings means more advertising. Well, yeah. means more which money, goes which where? Goes around uh, the funnily enough, it hasn't <laughs> translated into more grand final tickets for actual members no. of clubs. Well, that, that's another issue. I, I don't care about <laughs> the financial side. I just don't think... It, football works in the twilight um, time slot. Uh, the actual game. Well, there used to be a worry about Dewey, whatever, whatever. But with the, I don't know. That time of the year, a huge crowd. There's no problems with the quality of football. So really, to be honest, it doesn't, doesn't upset me. And you know what? I know this sounds really superficial, but if we get a bit of a nighttime, half time or finish, you can start to have a real, really impressive fireworks display. And that might, I know you'd. Oh. We're in Melbourne here, not Sydney. I can't oh. believe I'm hearing this. <laughs> Finey angling for a gig on Channel 7. All I know, it's not about Channel 7. It's not about mm. Channel 7, but not everybody is. Everybody's invested in the day. It's become a very big day in Melbourne and Australia, but not every. Some people like the frippery. And it could, there can be more frippery. All right, we'll move <laughs> on. I'll just conclude this discussion with four words. Over my dead body. And that's another reason to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations to Scott Jeffrey, um, the field umpire. After 308 games, he's going to officiate in his first grand final. So Who are the other two? And the other two are Simon Meredith and Matt Stevick. Oh, not those two again. <laughs> no, very good Trouble. umpires. I'm sure they'll do So if Schmitty missed out? Yes. Well, he did yep. well to forge yep. his way into the preliminary final. Yep. Did I pronounce it right or is the M silent? Oh, yeah, well, he gave that call. controversial overall on the deliberate call on uh, on uh, Saturday, which I thought was pretty bizarre. Mm. Okay. I thought it was good because he paid the first one. He paid a very similar one. Yeah, it's a judgment call, though. What are you doing overruling another umpire's judgment call? I know, that is controversial, but at least it, it gave one each and a consistent outcome. Yeah. And just a quick one from the Brownlow last night. I, I enjoy going through sort of some of the guys that have finished a bit lower, some of the younger guys that you think are, have polled really well and obviously get the uh, eye of the umpire. And just like Zach Merritt, 19 votes. Lockie Neal, 20. Patrick Cripps, 18. And Marcus Bonson Pelly, 20. So you uh, missed the big story. Of those four, who, who do you think can jag the first Brownlow? Oh, Bonson Pelly. Merritt, uh, 19 votes. Merit 19, I think it's the course, most yeah. votes polled by a wooden spooner um, player since Nathan Buckley in 1999. Yeah, but That's you know, step. next year he's got the midfield back. Yeah. He's not going to get anywhere near as many votes. Joe Watson, Heppel, etc. But I think one of the big stories is the the person who won the voting from non midfielders. Franklin. And Rewalt, 19 Rewalt, votes. Yes, yeah, 19 yeah, votes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good job. Is that it? Yeah, yeah that's it. Because it's time to go, John. Okay. Uh, we'll Farewell. See you, we'll see you next week for our post-grand final show. <laughs> I look forward to it. Yeah, good. <laughs> I knew I could lock you in. 
Oh, uh, and just one last one from the brand. Like, well done, Braden, for your rainy. <laughs> yes. Whoever you I are. I think so. <laughs> Whoever you are, you got a vote. Well okay, Fonny, do you have something to add to this segment? Yeah, well, sure. you know the doggies were incredibly, you know, one of the big reasons I reckon they won is because half the crowd were Bulldog supporters. Pretty amazing effort. Yep. They all drove up there. Now, you're going to have to watch very carefully for this because the, the convoy back to Melbourne along the Hume Highway, the dogs were out in force. Have a look at this. Greg, pass this idiot. <laughs> Every man and his dog. Yeah, not bad. Not bad. <laughs> All right, thanks, JP. Another break now. When we come back, have we got some nostalgia for you? Damien, Grant Dickinson from Footyology. I just had Meatloaf on the phone, and he said that after your game, he's now relieved that his is the second worst performance in front of an AFL crowd. Yeah, I'd probably agree. You know, the way we play, we haven't played well enough all year, so it's probably a fair conclusion. Welcome back. Preliminary final weekend has given us some of the most mo mem moment, meh, memorable moments and finishes in football history. We could have easily filled a whole show with them all, but we've narrowed it down to the five best because like the old guy who used to sell the peanuts out of the Hessian bag, so are the rounds of our lives. Okay, finally, I've been saying it every week, but I reckon this is our best crop yet. Preliminary finals. These are all from the 1990s. What a decade for preliminary finals. I was just going to say that we had a period there where we had become, I think there might have been five years in a row, five out of six years, where you just expected the preliminary final to be the best game of the year. Well, you're right. In fact, uh, this crop, it's... Uh yeah, five out of seven years. So uh, it's, a, it's an amazing run of incredible finishes. Yeah, well, the nineties was a great decade for many reasons, but uh, the quality of the preliminary finals was certainly one of them. And kudos to you, old man. For what? Well, a couple of these are heartbreaks for the Essendon Football Club, and I'm assuming they're there because they're two very famous games. I'm, I'm a newsman, Finey. Uh, you've got to put your uh, partisanship aside and appreciate the value of how great these games were. So let's go to number five on the list. It's 1997. Apologies, Bulldogs fans, but we had to do it. The Bulldogs look like they're set to play St Kilda in the grand final. They're 22 points up early in the last quarter. Looks like they're going to break the drought and get through to that grand final. Let's see what happens. The Saints next week. And what a grand final that would be. Two teams not really used to the last uh, last Saturday in September, KB. Still a long way to go in this game, Drew. Quick snap. Libra. Tony Liberatore celebrates a point. <laughs> Good win. A long way from home. The left foot out. Booms one in. In towards the big guards and Jarman rises above the pack. So this for his 200th career goal and his second for the day, but more importantly to keep the Crows in touch to give them some faint hope. By one, taken by Bickley, wonderful handball to Connell on the edge of the centre square. Jarman again is the target. Couldn't take it, he looked like he might have been held. No free kick, chance for Smart, a fumble. He's got it. Smart kicks a goal. Here come the Crows. They're going to have to stem this flow. Simon Goodwin. In just his ninth senior game with the Crows. To cover himself in glory. And he has. Over the centre. Johnson is there. Hudson. The hand pass to Mark West. A goal might seal it. The shot by West. Offline. And the Crows are still in this. Goes short. Finds Johnson. He's got it, Jarman! Mr. Magic's got it. They trail by two points. Look at the convention centre in Adelaide. The spotlight is on him. 35 metres out. The Crows are in front. They want West to produce some magic. He does with a long kick. They need a mark up at full form. Grant's a chance at the back. Chris Grant wobbles it in towards goal. That's Edwards good. gets back there. The hand pass away. Jamison. Siren! Crows are in the grand final! Oh, look at them, they've gone mad at Football Park. Oh, 
I've got to say, in my usual, I was there manner. I've never felt so deflated writing a story as I did that night. And apologies to Adelaide people because it was a great win and it was a great premiership the week later. But uh, uh, I felt like there are no fairy tales in football after that. Have we got a moment for an interesting story? Yep. I went to the game. St Kilda's in the grand final. Bulldogs lose, which uh, sort of suited St Kilda's. You know, Adelaide were considered a, a bit of a fluke result. I'm leaving the ground, and as I'm walking down Swan Street, I see comedian Russell Gilbert, who I'd never met in my life. He would go on to become my best mate. As he's walking across the ground, uh, across the road, I yell out, "Who's laughing now, funny guy?" And he goes to run back across the road and have a crack at me. And the guy he's with sort of holds him back and says, it's not worth it, it's not worth it. And I'm giving it, yeah, of course you're not. Well, of course, he became a great mate and would later tell me the bloke that held him back is more dangerous than a pack of pit bulls and he's very lucky the two of them didn't come at me. But that was the first time. And I told that to Gil, I told that, I said, you won't remember this. I started the story about six years later and he finished it. He's, he even rem remembered the words I used. And he hadn't remembered it was you? Well, he didn't know me. He, you know, that, I was a stranger. That, but funny guys laughing now. So that's now. how great friendships start, by taunting someone mercilessly. Well, funny guys laughing now because they're in the granny. And a St Kilda supporter. Jeez, you deserve what you nearly got. All right, let's move on. Uh, number four on the list. Now, finally mentioned a couple of Essendon tragedies here. But I did find time for an Essendon celebration, Finey. this is. But in all fairness... Allegiances aside, this is a great preliminary final. One of the great comebacks in finals history, Essendon and Adelaide. And this year, they were a bit of an upstart too. They beat Hawthorne in the uh, elimination final. Essendon lost the qualifying, beat uh, West Coast in the first semi. They're up against Adelaide, and the, the Bombers go in favourites. Well, Adelaide come flying out of the blocks, 42 points up at half time. It looks done and dusted. But an amazing comeback. Now, I'll just warn you here. When we see Mark McCurry's goal halfway through the third quarter finding, I've been to the MCG a lot. I've never, ever, ever in my life heard a louder roar than we'll hear after that goal. Let's have a look. Punched away by Long from Jarman. Rebounds for Watson. Handball brilliantly. Denham, unselfish. Buick will get it now. Right, this one was important. McCurry. Close to the boundary line, McCurry does well. Handball, Salmon, get the goal! It doesn't hurt to throw the arms out occasionally, let the umpire see what's happening. Well, especially when you're only 20 metres from goal. Buick going for his third, drop punt, he's got it. He's coming out and taking a nearly a great punt, but the recovery was enormous. Fletcher and Wengenin combined. Ella Richard's got the footy, running through the centre of the ground. Streaming away with a fourth bounce. Wenganin's turning, lip tack inside out in this turn. Taken by Carthorpe. McCurry goal. Goes for it. Six back. So Buick has a second chance from just over 20 metres. Pretty well straight in front. So you would nearly write this down for a goal. Gives it the long, long stages. Watson important. O'Donnell should go. Goes and puts it through. The Bombers are in front. Ola Renshaw favoured by the bounce. He's got it. Dispossessed by Tregenza. Very important position here. Taken by Brown. Wenganin's got it. Oh, Did he time. have the football? One wonders. Away goes Ola Renshaw. To Wenganin. In short, Watson. Shorter again, Mercury. No, Watson gets around. Forced to kick with the left. It slews off the side of his boot. Set a half back for Adelaide. Very important possession. Watson's got it. Watson goes for goal. The universe. Back in the last down. Essendon are home in the preliminary final. Thanks to a goal kicked by Timmy Watson. Graham Corn shakes his head in disbelief. And it's been one of the most remarkable games in the long history of this great game. To be seven goals behind at halftime. That's it. Ah, I could watch that again and again. But we won't. 
And finally, karma in football is a big thing. What the football gods giveth, the football gods taketh away. And they would do that to Essendon supporters six years later. It's a very famous final. The Blues, massive outsiders. Essendon expected to romp into the grand final. Carlton pulls one out of you know where. Massive last quarter. You guys have a look at it. I'm just going to avert my eyes. Looking for one last desperate thrust. Hold oh, takes the hand pass. Carlton into half forward. This looks better. Quarter again. Kick. To put Carlton back in front. It's a 55 metre plus kick. He's done exactly that. The Blues are back in the lead. Kick for goal. Might have no choice. It starts right. It swings back. Mercedes looks in towards half forward. They need a grab and they've got it this time. Johnson will have a shot. 47 metres out. That'll be just a dream unless this goes through. It's gone through. They're still there, the Bombers. Johnson. Is it going to be the young guns? He almost threw it out to Mercedes. It looked like a throw. It doesn't matter now. Play on. They need a mark. Alessio in front. Who's at the back? McCurry. McCurry. One behind. Where they need a big mark. A huge pack of players. Waiting down in front was Rice. His kick is a poor one. Straight to Wallace. The mean bad man. Can he cover himself in glory? He's lost it. And Murphy takes it away. That could be the turnover that cost them. Murphy goes towards the half forward line. Ratner's got it. He'll take his time. And that could just about seal it. Murphy drops in the hole on the 50. He'll pick himself up very slowly. What about the tackle by Fraser Brown back here at half back? That's the ball game. If it had gone to Fletcher, he could have bombed it from that distance. The luck of the draw in the final. This is uh, just an incredible comeback by the Carlton Football Club. They are into the grand final. Carlton. Carlton is into the grand final. <laughs> Amazing performance by the Carlton Footy Club. And it's the only time, really, that a side's gone on to lose a grand final and, and was still relatively satisfied oh, by having denied their arch enemy. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, Essendon were red-hot favourites, as you said, and Dean Wallace has to live with it. Just, you know, at a point down, just kick it long. and Oh, he had Fletcher on his left, finally. Fletcher would yeah. have made the distance with uh, but, with plenty to spare. He, even if he kicked it to the top of the square, most likely could have gone through for a point. And anyhow... That would be resolved the next year when, of course, with only one loss, Essendon had the almost perfect season. Well, I was talking to Wayne Carey yesterday, and all a moot point as far as he's concerned. He has no doubt North would have cleaned Essendon up in the grand final as well I as they did clean uh, Carlton up. I well, had all right. great, great doubts. It would have been a very interesting grand it final. It would have. Let's go on to number two on the list and uh, more heartbreak for Bomber people. Yes, finally, I was at this one too in the Noble Stand press box and it's seared in my memory. Sydney and Essendon, the Swans haven't been in the grand final for 41 years. Bit of a fairy tale. And the Bombers, well, they're going okay. Uh, they look like they're going to get through to another grand final with North Melbourne. What is it about being thwarted by playing North Melbourne in a grand final? Let's go to the last four minutes of action. Taking him as deep into the forward line as possible. Harvey, the 200 gamer, gives it off to Simons. He'll try and bend one back. Michael Simons, I think, might have just about done it. Towards the middle is Maxfield. He can go all the way down the ground. The Swans must kick a goal out of this. Maxfield, two bounces. Have another one and kick for goal. He doesn't. It's going to fall short. James Hurd can't get there. And Lewis is back in the square. Dale Lewis for his third goal. Still in the middle, that all-important break. It's taken by Kelly. He kicks it towards left half forward. Garlic's the man. Over the top he goes. Chapman off to Maxfield. The left foot has got to get it in towards Lockett. Lockett marks in the pocket. He plays on. A centre in kick. He wants Creswell. And he's got it. Great finish. Creswell. 48 metres from home. It's a high kick. He's there. He's made. Scored on the three. The Swans get a point here.
Okay, a couple of quick points. The kick from Darren Creswell swung about two feet left to right. Looked like it was going to be a certain point. Secondly, look, no one likes parking themselves in the road of Plugger, but I reckon Justin Blumfield could have just gone a little bit harder at the end there. Well, as you said, nobody likes doing it, and he didn't do it. Darren Creswell was brilliant around that time, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. He won them a few games. I remember a game against Hawthorne where he took a, a mark in the goal square in the dying. Well, that room. was two weeks previously yeah. in the uh, elimination final. I mean, he was just a very, very good footballer. Underrated, Darren Creswell, actually. All right, let's get to number one on the list. Now, I need to say here, this is my best game in the history of football. Not only is it a great final, I reckon if I could only watch one game over and over again for the rest of my life, this would be it. End-to-end, uh, reasonably high scoring for most of it. It was tough. A couple of comebacks from either side. This game had absolutely everything, including one of the most memorable finishes in football history. It's 1994. It's the preliminary final between North Melbourne and Geelong. Hinkley, deep in his own defensive area. A cool head. A very cool head. Hocking had to wait, though. Opportunity for Stevens. Stevens, 25 metres out. He's missed. He has missed. And takes the ball. Wayne Carey. Longmire. Hinkley punches. Allison. Allison. Oh, he's missed it. Well, then, awkward bounce. McGrath heads for the boundary line. Now it's a foot race. Carey's in front. McGrath in close attendance. Carey hurriedly onto the boot. Allison, awkward bounce. He's 25 metres from goal. This time, perhaps, he settles against it. Here come the kangaroos. Back in the middle with just five points the difference and under six minutes left. Chest mark to Rob. A straight kick and they're in front. Rob's kick. Centre of the ground, Gary Hocking. Oh. Magnificent mark. Wide to Wills. Now the Cats a chance. They trail by a point. Andrew Wills with pace. Nobody in front of him has missed it, but the scores are level. Will a point be enough? Won't make it. Oh! oh. oh. Barnes. <laughs> His second mark of the day, Barnes. Do I play on? Just three minutes of that game leaves you breathless, doesn't it? It was like that for the entire four quarters. Uh, great game and uh, brilliantly called by the soon-to-be-retired one-more-game Dennis Committee. So many ifs and buts in that game too. Wayne Schwoss, if you just found kid, Darren yeah. Crocker. Bardsey drops a mark at the end for, after, after take taking the, the, the game-saver. And, of course, the late Paul Couch figuring prominently. And, uh, incidentally, fantastic tribute to Couchy on the um, on the Brownlow coverage last night. What a, a sad loss he was. He was a lovely, very likeable guy and a brilliant footballer. Yeah, you picked some good games. Well done. And that last game, as you said, three minutes of it leaves you panting. So, imagine 100 minutes of footy like that. It is all on YouTube. So, uh, have a look if you want to see more of it. I thoroughly recommend it. Let's get to a break. When we return, you ask the questions, we give the answers. Anui's hair seems a little bit dry. 
Do you think it'll affect him for next week? We'll have to see. Yeah, he's done a lot of conditioning, so I we'll have to see what, where he's at. He's only 19 or 20, so I don't want to push him too quickly. So. Jose, Grant Dickinson from Footyology, is there any truth to the rumour you might be coaching the Brisbane Lions next year? <laughs> Thanks for joining us here on Footyology. So many questions about this season, so few answers. Who knows how it's going to turn out? Not us, but our stabs in the dark have been scientifically proven to be a lot closer than 86% of other pundits' guesswork. Send in your queries using the footyology hashtag and we'll argue a very convincing case that we know what we're talking about. It's time for Keyboard Q&A. Okay, Fanny, we all know how it works. You read the name, I read the question. Go. Johnson von Trapp. Oh, it's our friend Andrew Burt in the United States who and, says... And sadly, one of the von Trapp children... Or the actress who played one of the Von Trapp yes, children I saw passed that. away. Weasel, was he? Yeah, Good. so long farewell, ad Wiedersehen, adieu. Now, Andrew is our uh, US correspondent. Oh, now this is this is the power of live TV. The presidential debate's on there at the moment, Fanny. He says, Trump in all sorts of trouble here. Hillary up by six goals at quarter time. What do we think? I don't know. Uh, well, I'm, I'm hoping that Hillary goes on to a very solid victory there, as is most of the uh, sane world, I think. To be one of the most uh, dubious presidents of all time, but in this two-horse race, she probably needs to be the winner. Well, yes, I use the word sane, and she is at least that. Okay, next. Uh, this one's from Donald Trump, or our Donald Trump, Sam McSweeney. I know that name. Have the Bulldogs played the best final series by a team ever? I think Sam might be showing his Bulldog colours there, Finey. Yeah. Ever? I think they'd have to win it to, to establish that. Richmond were pretty good in 1980. Uh, yeah, Richmond were pretty good in 1969. Came from fourth spot, beat Geelong by over 100 points. Beat Collingwood in the preliminary, beat Carlton in the grand final. But Fitzroy in 1916 get the nod. After winning from last place on the ladder. Only four teams. They were last all year and they won the final series, which was a round-robin comprehensively. Actually, I've got a serious answer to this question, a serious answer, and it is North Melbourne 1977, the only team that's had to play five finals to win a flag. Lost the qualifying final to Hawthorne, beat Richmond in the first semi, smashed Hawthorne when they played them again in the preliminary final, drew the grand final with Collingwood after trailing by 27 points at three-quarter time, won the replay. Can't have a better finals campaign than that. And who was the only player to play every game that season? John Casson. And that's why we're footyologists. <laughs> Next. Nick. Nick asks, how do the dogs fit Lin Jong and Matt Suckling into a side that played so well against GWS? Very good question. Someone's going to be really stiff. Um, I think they need Jong. I think they need his hardness coming up against the Swans midfield. And his, and his ground coverage is very good. And he's flexible too. He could probably creep forward and kick a goal. And Suckling, you know, they, that um, ball use is so important. He's also the only guy on the list who's played in the grand final. So I, I wouldn't play Suckling. I'd play Jong. At whose expense? It's, this is going to sound terrible because Fletcher Roberts was great on Saturday night, but he played because there was an extra tall GWS forward, and I think he has to make way. Well, it's going to be... I, I reckon it's going to be more difficult at the selection table for the two coaches this year than I can remember for a long time. But at least Sydney has a bottom six that you can start picking off. You know, Harry Marsh, good first year, but he'd be in some sort of danger and maybe ex Richards and uh, Hewitt. But the, that the dogs, no one deserves to get dropped. No, no, I agree with that. OK, next. Kale Volotakis, a great season of contribution from him. He is. He's been terrific, a real uh, stayer. And Kale asks, oh, hang on. How pissed, oh, this is to me, how pissed were you and Dermot on the... 3 triple R party show on Saturday night. Hand on heart, Kale, not at all. I did uh, Headley Gritter as the host. He doles out the Crown Lagers. I had one. I think Dermy. great effort by Dermy too. He was up in Sydney for the game, got on a 10pm flight, lobbed in the triple R studios in um, Brunswick at uh, about 12.20, and much mirth was had. It's a great show, the party show. Headley Gritter should be rhyming slang for a toilet. Oh. No, don't do all that. He's a good, good man, Headley. No, hey, you, 
Once you're rhyming slang, you're part of the vernacular. Actually, we we got Tony Wendard, a great media man and football commentator on the phone. I've never heard him so happy. It was almost a, a childlike uh, joy at seeing his team finally in grand final. And we rang Dougie Hawkins finally, who at about 1am, it's fair to say, was a little bit the worst for wear. There's a, there's a few doggies in the media. How happy would Mark Stevens be at the moment? Well, I saw I did see him twirling his scarf around at the moment. Be an interesting post-grand final press conference if they win. Yeah, he yeah. might shove Bevo off a desk and start answering questions himself. <laughs> All right, next tweet. Um, Matty Costello. Who asks, can the Bulldogs' magnificent team defence curtail Buddy's big stage brilliance? It's a good question. Uh, I reckon it can. I reckon Dale Morris is the man for him, you'd think, wouldn't you? Yeah, he's taken Morris to the cleaners a couple of times. Um, but it, like, like he suggests, though, it's team defence that does the job for them, and it's basically preventing the opposition getting the supply. So restricting their inside 50s, making those entries they do get hurried and under pressure. Um, I, I wonder, Buddy's played up the ground a bit this final series. I wonder if the Bulldogs would be happy for that to happen. Buddy on grand final day is an interesting scenario. I mean, Buddy-centric cost Hawthorne in 2012. They Correct. just were too... He was in great form, but they were too willing to get the ball to him. In fact, he played brilliantly in 2014. When they got done. Done like a dinner. Um, well, remember Hawthorne 2008 too. He almost played a decoy sort of role. So we, we haven't... We've, it's been a different buddy on grand final day. Maybe yeah. this is the time he busts loose. Yeah, well, uh, Morris will get the job and Morris has been great. Yep. All right, next tweet. Tony B. Who says, do you think Pye's dad's army recruiting strategy is pure desperation from Bucks to keep his job? Um, no, I don't. I've been, I've been really surprised by it, to be honest. I mean, it sort of indicates a team that thinks it's closer than its latter position would suggest. They've done okay out of some of those season recruits, but Chris Mayne, Daniel Wells? Well, let's settle. It hasn't happened yet. Mm. The water under the bridge. Oh, they're clearly interested. What I like about that text or that SMS was the spelling of Bucks. B-U-X. Is that Graham Bucks from Fitzroy? Ah, <laughs> oh, very good. Remember him? He was at Collingwood, I think, wasn't he? Graham Bucks. Oh, I remember him. I think at Fitzroy he had a moustache and he was um, workmanlike. Anyway, answer the question. What do you think? Uh, it's reeks of stupidity. Daniel Wells is 32, will be 32 before the first bounce of next season. And injury prone. 19 games this year. Two games the year before, four games the year before that. Not a good move. And Chris Mayne, um, are they trying to collect third forwards that are completely superfluous to teams' needs? Lynch, White, Mayne. How? Why? Although when? <laughs> yeah, that's good. How, how I thought was okay. No, but when, yeah, he, when he moved back. But I mean, the, this search for a third tall forward, uh, you know who's going to be their next recruit? if they keep going down this track. A bloke from the doggies called Travis Cloak. <laughs> uh, very good, very good. I, I just think they've got more young talent than yeah, it they appears they, yeah. they give themselves credit for. They probably do need another tall forward though, when Cloak leaves, to work with... Darcy uh, Moore? Yeah, I mean, Mason Cox and White won't be it, but either will Chris Mayne. No, no, I agree with that. Well, he's hardly a, a tall forward either. All right, thanks for your tweets. Good uh, collection this week. Oh, hang on, one more. Do oh, yeah, I'll oh, make Dole, Dole Plunger. Uh, put the Bulldogs list under Richmond's stewardship and they finish 13th. What do you think? Um, oh, I think they'd be a bit better than 13th, would they? No, not necessarily. Really? I'll, tell you, I'll say this. I can't think of a coaching performance that's been a better example of the difference a good coach can make. Yeah, this has been an investment in the entire list. Not telling 25 of the guys you can win us a, a final, telling 40 guys you can be part of a premiership, and they believe it. Football is all about the single belief of the unit now. There's no real key positions. There's no super match winners, maybe except for Buddy. They've, they are invested, and you know what? If there were three injuries this week, You'd still like them. Well, this is a guy who came in halfway through the pre-season before last, missed the trade period. Uh, last Saturday night's side had only seven players that have come into it since his arrival. It's just been improvement from within, and nothing uh, better demonstrates the uh, abilities of a coach than that, I think, that getting that improvement from within. So, And he's almost put a sword through chipping, kicking, 
slowing, going backwards. He could be the best thing for football since football. No, here, here. All right, a final break now. Don't go anywhere because our own premiership quarter is coming right up. Brad, do you lose focus with Pauline Hanson ringing up all the time? Oh, no. Wanting James Brayshaw's job? James, that affected my focus. <laughs> yeah. um, Please explain. <laughs> Welcome back. We're seeing football romance unfold before our very eyes this week. With romance comes passion, and with passion comes irrationality. And no one does irrationality better than us. We're unhinged, we're angry, and we'll shout a lot on the footyology rant off! I'm going first. You're silly. Okay, I know I am, but I'm angry. Count me in. Here we go. Three, two, grand final. I'm pissed off about the Brownlow medal coverage, Finey. What are they playing at turning it into a quasi-fashion show? Bloody wags and red carpet everywhere and all this, who are you dressed by? Okay, so I still need a bit of help putting on my polyester tie, but what, are they incapable of putting on their own clothes now? I pine for a simpler time. You know, like when Dick Reynolds won his first Brownlow in 1934 and the VFL posted it out to him. He didn't get it for 10 years because the mailman stuffed up and until the day she died, old Thelma Reynolds down the road thought she was the best footballer in the country. Who could forget Bob Skelton getting his third Brownlow medal at Festival Hall with a couple of huge black eyes and Graham Teasdale's brown velvet suit in 1977. If Paddy Dangerfield is so daring, why didn't he turn up on Monday night wearing something like that? I want to return to old values, like the captains of every club standing up on stage, adjusting their team's leaderboard, having a few too many crownies, then knocking the whole thing over. And when they pick it up and replace all the little numbers, suddenly it's not Gary Dempsey leading the count, but Terry Wheeler. And listen, Channel 7, if you're going to let TV celebrities recap the season, get someone with real credibility, like Cookie from A Country Practice, or that Hot Dogs guy from Big Brother. Better still, drag out that old rotisserie and put Mick Malloy on it, preferably over some hot coals! Angry, aren't you? Well, you know, it's a football award, not a fashion event. We don't need celebrities taking us through the season's highlights. You were just upset because Dr. Edelston didn't bring a pair of boobs this year. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I missed that. I did miss the pneumatic partner uh, that he usually turns up with. Okay, your turn. Three, two, one. Rant! When the final siren goes on Saturday afternoon, there'll be a tsunami of elation for either the Doggies or Swans fans. But for me and other footyologists, it'll mark a sad moment, the end of the season. No football, a void, a gap. How I used to try and fill that gap. Next week, I'd watch the Sandful Grand Final. Mm, They didn't fill it. And then there was the national championships, or as I prefer to call it, the day Mal Brown went mad. I even tried following Northern Territory football for one season. I thought, I'm going to follow the Saints, St Mary. But when I found out they were going for their 29th Premiership, I thought it might have been jumping the bandwagon and might have missed the boat. No, there's nothing. There's a horrible week of Bathurst. I don't understand Bathurst. Moffat, Brock, Rock, Collision. That's not sport, that's traffic. And then on to the cricket season with all its one day is 2020s and who knows what's. I'm going to miss your football. I don't want that final siren to go. I'm already empty. No, for me, it will be a sad moment, whoever wins the bloody thing. I need football because I'm a footyologist. Well spoken, Finey. I I love grand final day, but I hate that moment when I'm sitting there halfway through my match report and it starts to get dark and everyone's off the ground. I think, yeah, well... My life has no meaning until next March. No, you have to. Yeah, you know, I'm going to have to learn the names of all the Pakistani cricketers <laughs> again, till I get rubbed out. Yeah, oh, they're, they're coming, and then the South Africans, and I don't know. I just need my footy. Okay, big week coming up. Let's get serious for about 15 seconds. Grand final tip, margin, and why? I really need to see the teams as we sit here today. I'm tipping the Swans by seven points. I'm, as I said, I think it's going to be a great game. The doggies are going to be as tenacious as they have been all final series but the Swans do have that brilliant midfield that runs deep and a man called Buddy Franklin who's going to be the best forward on the ground most likely. Just a little tip because I know a lot of people love those novelty bets 
and I reckon they're worth having. First goal, up the Sydney end, go for McGlynn or Papley, I reckon that, that's a good way, and some value up the other end, Dunkley and McLean, and for your Norm Smith medalist, value for either side, I reckon Jason Johannesson, you saw last night that people love him, he could easily get the three votes, and Tommy Mitchell, the other midfielder for the Swans, could be good value. You ran the full gamut of tipping there. Um, I'm joining you. I'm going for Sydney. Uh, finished on top for a reason. Look, I think the Doggies are a big chance. I really do. They've beaten them the last two times. Only by four points, but they've beaten them. I just think the Swans' quality in midfield is a bit better. I think they're a bit stronger. And I think, uh, look, Bulldogs, great contested team. But I think strength and experience counts for plenty on Grand Fold Day. And don't underestimate, we talk about the motivation for the Doggies. Don't underestimate the motivation for the Swans bouncing back off what was one of the most spectacularly awful grand final performances in 2014. And I can tell you, speaking to a few Sydney people this week, that has stayed with them. They are still stung by that and want desperately to atone. So, look, I think they're the more reliable bet. I do hope the Doggies win, but I'll be very happy for the Swans to win. I'm going for Sydney by 24 points. Well, that's a fair margin. The other thing was, that loss that Sydney had to in the first week of the finals to GWS, they've, they've bounced back and they've learnt from it. Doggies haven't lost for a while, and I know it sounds crazy, but that loss is a good thing. Yeah, I think it, it did transpire to be a good thing. Well, that's it for another week. Thanks for watching. We're on every Tuesday at 12 p.m. live on Facebook, upload on YouTube, 7.30 p.m. on Channel 31, Thursday nights Fox tells Aurora, and probably after the 2 a.m. Tupperware special on the Home Chopping home shopping home shopping channel as well remember people like folk music legends peter paul and mary lamented the loss of childhood innocence and simpler pleasures puff the magic dragon lived by the sea and frolicked in the autumn mist watching footyology oh my god we'll see you next week <laughs>you know with all the programs they've had in place and the youth girls coming through like I went and watched the youth girls carnival <clears throat> a couple of months ago and I was blown away like they were you know the skill level and <clears throat> the way they moved the ball was phenomenal so it, the, the skill is definitely there